My name is Karen Wagg and I'm a conservation technician in the Paper and Textiles Conservation Lab at the National Museum of Australia and I would like to begin today by acknowledging the traditional owners on the land of which we meet. Today's workshop is part of our Door to Store Caring for Your Collection series and during this session we will be discussing and demonstrating some of the principles of caring for hats and shoes. I would like to welcome everyone here today and advise you that the program is being recorded and your attendance is considered consent to be recorded. So can everyone uh, now please ensure that your mobile phones are switched to silent. I would also like to extend a welcome to everyone who is tuning in live from the Kayama Library today. Let's cross to Kayama and to Michelle Hudson, the Manager of Library Services at Kayama Library, who will be facilitating the program from her end. So thank you and welcome, Michelle. Um, good afternoon to you all. I'm with, here with a small but very dedicated um, self-confessed shoeaholics that are really interested in um, hearing your presentation today. Um, and we look forward to asking you some questions at the end of the session. Thank you. Thank you. So the idea for this session came about because our conservation team has recently been treating and preparing a number of wonderful examples of hats and shoes for our Glorious Days Australia 1913 exhibition, which is currently on in the Temporary Exhibition Gallery. So I urge everyone here today to visit the exhibition. And for those of you in Kayama, um, the exhibition runs until the 13th of October this year, so you have plenty of time to get to Canberra to check it out. So in addition to treating um, damage and preparing objects for display, our conservation team also ensures the preservation of the museum's collection by implementing preventative measures relating to the maintaining suitable environmental conditions for objects, ensuring good handling practices and having the correct types of physical storage for items. Many of the issues surrounding the preservation of um, our museum objects are the same as for your treasured items at home. So I'll go over some of the general preventive principles um, of providing good care for hats and shoes before handing over to um, textiles conservator um, uh, Michelle um, Newton-Edwards and senior paper and textiles conservator Camilla Mollica, um, who will look at some good techniques for handling and storage. So deterioration and damage um, to hats and shoes occurs because of inherent and external factors. The inherent factors relate to aspects of the physical makeup of objects which causes them to deteriorate and these problems can be difficult to deal with. External factors that contribute to deterioration and damage are easier for us to control. So something worth thinking about when it comes to your own hats and shoes is whether these are items that you wish to wear or whether you're putting them away um, to be preserved for the future. And if you do intend to wear the items, um, you need to accept that there will be some general damage caused through use. If you wish to preserve the items by putting them away, then dark storage is the best place for shoes and hats, as visible and particularly UV light causes materials to fade and become brittle. Shoes and hats are generally very susceptible to the damage caused by light and, um, and this um, damage is cumulative and irreversible. Storage areas should ideally have a relative humidity of between 45 and 55%. Um, this is not always easy to attain, um, but really you also want to try and keep the relative humidity stable, um, as this is important because the amount of moisture in the air can cause materials in hats and shoes to swell and contract. Um, and this leads to distortion of items. The distortion can be accentuated when there are numerous different types of materials present because um, these will be affected at different rates. So if possible, there should be no dramatic or frequent fluctuations to relative humidity. Stable temperatures are also important um, as temperature has a direct relationship with relative humidity and generally um, speaking, conditions that are comfortable for humans are good for hats and shoes. So when your hats and shoes are affected by pests and mould, this tends to also be um, related to poor environmental conditions. So look for what the cause of these outbreaks is. Um, keep your storage areas clean and check your shoes and hats regularly um, so that any mould, rodent or insect damage can be detected early. When items do sustain this type of damage, it is probably best to consult a conservator and you can find a conservator in your area by visiting the AICCM, which is the Australian Institute for the Conservation of Cultural Materials website um, at www.aiccm.org.au. So the conditions in the centre of your house will generally be the best and most stable place to store your items and try to avoid places against external walls or in roof cavities or under houses and things like that. 
When you handle your shoes and hats, you should ensure that your hands are clean or if you, can, if you prefer, you can wear gloves. Close-fitting, powder-free surgical plastic gloves are good. Cotton gloves can be fine for some things, um, like leather shoes, but you do need to be aware that they can catch on um, some of the materials on hats and shoes. So always support the hats and shoes when you are moving them, particularly if they are old and fragile. Um, storing it, your, your shoes and hats in boxes will protect them from dust and air pollution, um, but the enclosures should be correctly dimensioned and constructed from archival quality storage materials. Um, so now I'm going to hand over to um, Carmela and Michelle, who will demonstrate some of these um, types of storage. Thanks, Karen. Um, like Karen said, uh, the, there's various techniques that we do use to look after our hats and shoes in our collection. What we're going to do here today is really touch on three main ones that we look at. And as we all know, there's such a variety of shoes, boots and hats. So a lot of these techniques can be adapted for each of those different um, uh, items. So we'll talk about soft supports, we'll talk about rigid supports and we'll talk about boxing. There are times when we combine uh, the different techniques to achieve what we want to achieve. So I'll, talk, I'll start talking about our uh, soft supports. When, when we talk about soft supports it means something that I can actually compress and mould into an item. We can use them in the shoes. Um, if we've got a pair of shoes that uh, have already got a fairly firm toe, a soft support is going to be enough to just help that shape and maintain it in storage because we all know things collapse over time and, exp and if you're familiar with, uh, you might have a collection of shoes uh, that have already compressed. So we want to maintain that simplest way to achieve one of those is either good old pair of socks <laughs> that you can buy um, and we usually go for light colours as well if possible and cotton. Once we've got a pair of socks um, we then fill them up with a Dacron wadding and Dacron wadding is what you'll find in your doona covers, a lot of quilters use them and we purchase that from your local haberdashery store. Even before we you know, start our supports, really need to look at your item and assess its condition, the materials it's made out of, um, and, and really look at it and see, well, if I do put in a soft support, is that going to achieve what I'm trying to achieve? Am I going to cause further damage? If you're unsure about it, it's probably best not to do, put anything in there. Um, leave it. You, we do find that a lot of the shoes the older shoes have got silk linings that have started to disintegrate, so applying or adding something else to it may cause further damage. But going back to the soft support, um, I'll just demonstrate a little what we call a, a sausage, or and that can vary in size. It could be a big fat one or a, a slim one. We roll our Dacron, make a little tube out of our smooth fabric, and that's another thing when you look at your socks making sure that they're quite smooth and don't have firm ridges um, on your sock because anything that's rigid can imprint into your item over time, especially if it's a silk shoe or something like that, or even a leather. Here we're using um, what we call a par silk, which is a polyester lining fabric that dressmakers will use and again, our haberdashery store is our best friend. We find a lot of fabrics from um, well, local spotlight is, um, is a good one. But whenever we do use any of the fabrics, we need to make sure that we pre-wash them uh, just to remove any starches or impurities that may have um, impregnated into the fabric during manufacture because, again, we want to remove any of those impurities that over time will cause damage to, to our items. So we've filled up this sausage with your Dacron and we then try and, well, we need to close off the ends. The reason being is we don't want any little insects sort of crawling into our supports and starting little nests and causing further damage. And as Karen mentioned, our pest 
management side of it is a very important thing that we need to consider. So in order to uh, very quickly fill up or close up the end, um, I just fold over the edge and run a running stitch uh, with my cotton and the needle, just uh, in and out pulling it through all the way around and then just pulling that thread and you can see it's just filling up, closing that end off and a couple of stitches to then secure it off and I end up with a finished edge like that. So they're really handy to be able to squeeze in softly into that. Um, from our sort of softer supports we can then use them also in, in our little bonnets or our bigger hats. A couple examples here um, with this little, I'll just pull this little bonnet out. You can see we've made like a, almost a little doona for it inside because one of the things that we do want to prevent is sharp creases in our textiles because over time they will cause splitting of the fibres. So by providing that little bit of support um, will prevent that. In this case there's a little lovely little rosette and we want to make sure that's sitting facing upwards in the box that we're going to put it into. In the, well, as we can see here I've managed to fit four little bonnets in the one box so if you've got the space an individual box and Michelle will talk more about boxing uh, but in this case we've combined a number of them and interleaved with again our little dunas and um, covers. Um, one thing that we do need to look at is dye transfer, so we need to make sure that there's some separation there. Um, going on from our soft supports, we can go into our rigid supports. So they're a lot firmer. They're great for our boots. So. In this case, these are quite firm to start off with, but a lot of boots will, you sit them up and they'll flop over and eventually they'll split along that bent over area. So we want to provide a firm support in there. What we use for, for the firm supports is what we call an ether foam. And what the ether foam is, it's a quite a firm polypropylene plastic. So there are no plasticizers that can Im be emitted from this plastic and cause discol discoloration or degradation of our items. It's quite firm so it's not going to compress. Um, and this it's quite nice, you can use a carving knife or a Stanley knife to shape whatever shape you want to make, whether it's something like that, a little dome for a hat, um, or in this case our little shapes for our boots and because our feet, well once we've got the shoe, <laughs> our little firm inserts don't bend as easily as our foot does, sometimes we do need to make them into two parts. So in this case it's got a little foot section that feeds into the bottom part of the boot and you can probably see my little tail on that and that's to assist me when I want to retrieve it. So I'm not having to put my hand down the middle of the boot. I can just gently pull that up and retrieve it again. And then the centre of it can just sit in there and retain its shape. But again, if you look at the foam, it's quite a, a rough surface. We want to achieve that nice smooth surface so we're not catching on anything inside the item. We cover that with our Dacron wadding. Again, similar, exactly the same as what I explained earlier. Cover that surface. The nice thing about this ether foam is you don't have to do any stitching. You can just slit the foam and it just pokes into that groove and it retains in there. So you can see, and it just has the one seam and the rest of it's quite smooth. Once we've covered that in the Dacron, we then do cover it in the par silk again. So again, the same, applying over the surface and feeding it back into that original slit that we've got. And you've got a nice smooth surface. 
Ether foam, pool noodles, same thing. So that's something that um, we can use. It's the same material. Obviously, it comes in various colours that um, we need to be a bit wary about. Um, so by covering it totally in the two layers will prevent that um, any transference of, of colours with that. We can still achieve the firm firmness for a support, even with our little Dacron sausage, by using a carval card and slipping that into the inside the cover. So for example, if it's not quite the right size, but that would slip inside and the wadding would be in the centre, the card around it, and then the, deck, the par silk covering the whole item. And that will create a rigid form for us. So our, our card is also a good thing to use. Sometimes you only need a little bit of support around the, um, the inside of the hat. So archival card, and Karen mentioned um, about our archival materials, so they need to be acid-free um, and inert materials. But what we do need to make sure that we don't use any staples, any metal fastenings um, when we join or create that shape. So in this case, I've just used some cotton thread and stitched the two together. You can see that and just, it's quite nice, it's joined them together. And that will sit inside the hat nicely. So just um, just a couple of um, examples here using the rigid support. And you can see you can, sometimes you need to be quite creative for something like this with a lovely brim on it. Um, we need to support it. So here we've actually created quite an interesting shape. Um, don't know if you... So in two bits, a triangular bit to support the, the brim of it. And this is using the rigid system. There's ribbons with the bonnet. They've been rolled, and Michelle will talk about rolling um, later. So it's firmly held its shape. We're not creating any extra creases in that little bonnet. Then we've got this other little cap here. Before I lift it, you can see that it actually sits above um, the surface. So again, lifting things off the surface. So when we go to handle these items, we're actually not touching the edge of the, the, of the hat. It's actually the support that we're sort of hold, holding, I suppose. In this case, we've got a combination of two. So it's the rigid support here, and then inside to retain that sort of full shape, we've created little sausages inside that sit there and hold their shape. Just firmly there. Um, just going across to these little shoes here, um, with just little triangular shapes are enough to support that little shoe tip just there. And they're just firmly. We don't want to make the forms and push them too hard in the, in the shoe. It needs to provide the support but not crammed in there so that you're causing further damage to it. Um, what else have we got? Little, sometimes you may want to consider making little bags for the individual shoes or boots. Um, just simple, the par silk fabric, a little draw string bag, uh, which is nice to store them in, um, to protect them again from dust and things like that that Karen mentioned. Um, I've got a hat stand here. Some people like to display hats. And rather than sort of sitting a hat straight onto the spike of um, 
of the hat stand. I mean, if it's your general everyday sun hat that you're going to be wearing, that's not a problem. But if it is something of um, significance that you want to look after, a, a rigid support like this with a hole in the end that sits inside your, your hat and then pokes into the, the spoke of the hat stand and you can create quite a nice display of hats, again, keeping in mind all your parameters, your, your light levels, your dust, um, exactly what um, Karen mentioned earlier. Um, oh, I don't know what else to say, but... <laughs> But it's a, a lot of the, um, you know, these techniques, and like I said, there's such a variety of items out there that you just bring in your creativity and just keeping in mind your creases and your um, assessing your object. Yes, can I put in something soft and not cause any further damage? Um, yes, I do need to provide the support. It needs to be a bit rigid. Don't cram it in there. Um, handling. Um, I think a lot of damage does occur with incorrect handling of your item. So we look at, you know, we use our eyes a lot and, and look at the item in detail before we even attempt any of these techniques. So I'll hand you over to Michelle, who will talk about once we sort of assess all of this and work out our system of padding, um, we also then look at boxing, which is very important as well. Thanks, Thanks, Carmela. Well, I'll talk generally about the two main types of storage boxes that we use in the museum, first of all, and then I'll just take you through a few examples to give you some specific ideas about how you can store components uh, of your hats and shoes. So we use an uh, archival corrugated board uh, for our boxes, which we have in both ready-made sizes and also we can make these uh, to a custom size for our hats and shoes. Uh, the benefit of the corrugated archival board is that, um, as well as protecting your object from, from dust and light, it also um, reduces the rate of exchange in temperature and humidity for your object, um, particularly if you have other buffering materials inside, uh, which helps keep your object in a more stable environment. And they can also be used uh, inside a larger box, so you can have a number of objects together in a box and, and have them separated. One of the considerations with uh, the corrugated board is that um, because it is corrugated, it does leave a nice little space for insects to get into the walls of the box. So in the museum, we have a preventive conservation officer who obviously is monitoring our collection. But at home, you can overcome this by using archival tape along the edges of your box to, to prevent insects making a home in there. The other type of box that we use is uh, polypropylene. And these are a ready-made size that we use. Um, the disadvantage with them is that um, they can have a, create a microclimate inside while, while they obviously keep moisture out. If you have them in a situation where uh, you have a sudden change in high humidity, you can cause condensation inside of that box, which then can lead to mould or mildew on your objects. So you possibly need more buffering material inside um, of those boxes. Obviously, when you have... Uh, a cardboard box, you want to put it in a situation in your house where it's not going to have any direct moisture, so you need to be careful about placing it, say, in the floor of a cupboard uh, where you might have moisture coming up underneath. Um, also, you want to make sure that they're not stored near, say, a hot water system or where you possibly may have um, leaks through the roof or from leaky pipes. So it's important to make sure that, that you monitor uh, your storage frequently and uh, keep an eye on that and obviously move objects to a better place in the house if that's happening. Uh, so inside the box, one, once we have the dimensions which are best suited to our object, uh, we can then use... Uh, the internal supports that Carmela has spoken about, um, especially if you have multiple objects together. For example, these hats, uh, the supports are actually connected to the base, which then can be lifted into your box, which means the objects are separated from each other. And if you have uh, a special 
significant object, it means that you can view those objects or, or have your family around to view those objects and really reduce the amount of handling of those. This is another example where we have a drop-down side, we have some cotton tape just threaded to holes through the side, and we have a support which is again connected to a tray which can be lifted out and that can easily be viewed without handling. The other consideration is um, when you're storing objects together is to try to put similar weights and materials together. For example, uh, it's, you, you wouldn't put a, a military helmet with a christening bonnet because you have that danger of one falling on top of another and crushing it. So it's, it's a good idea to sort of have like objects together in a box. Um, you would keep pairs of shoes together in a box. And I'll show you this example. This is a pair of flat shoes um, which have just been placed inside. Sorry, they're just, um, so what we've done here is actually use the corrugated card to cut a template out which sits inside the box and prevents those objects moving around and then they are tied in place. Um, we also have a photo of that object on the lid, so that's a good idea if you have um, multiple boxes to have uh, labelling and photos so that you know exactly what's in those boxes without having to sort of rummage through them all the time. Uh, another consideration is um, dye transfer. If you have coloured flowers or coloured feathers, it's a good idea to have those objects uh, separated um, from perhaps light coloured objects so that you don't have any dye transferring. And you need adequate space inside your box so that uh, your, your decorative aspects of your object do not suffer any dam damage from being crushed against the side of the box. This one is a good example of that where it has ribbons that we've actually rolled onto concrete, sorry, onto uh, cardboard rolls that have been covered in tissue, which reduces the amount of space that we need for the boxing and also keeps the ribbons flat. So they're, they're held there in a, a very um, good situation. And we have plenty of room around our fabric flowers here so that they are not being crushed and then our solid support underneath is actually connected again to the bottom of the box. Here we have an example where we have multiple components that are together. So this tray, we actually have a lift out section at the bottom. We have a tray with handles which fits inside this box where we have other components that are related to this object as well. Uh, and this one you can see again, it's, it's a matter of really having a look at what types of materials your object is made from to decide what supports are going to be best. Here we have a very soft Dacron sausage roll which is actually supporting uh, the daisies on, on the back of these shoes. So really it's um, a matter of analysing your object, working out where it needs the best kind of support and you can fit out your boxes with um, separate components, separate compartments. Again, you can use uh, trays or smaller boxes inside to separate your objects. Um, in terms of your buffering material, um, archival tissue or soft supports are what we would generally use at the museum. For long-term storage, uh, soft supports in fabrics that are inert and are, are not going to cause any damage by off-gassing to our objects are uh, our preference. So we would use, again, the uh, par silk sausages, um, par silk inside of a box um, with a layer of Dacron underneath, and that can be something very simple that you can incorporate into perhaps your storage of your shoes in a shoe box is a layer of Dacron with a par silk covering over the top, um, or you can separate, again, as Carmela mentioned, separating your object separately into bags. So I think that's really covered um, most of the aspects of, of the boxing. You can use, um, obviously, go to your general uh, plastic tubs that you can purchase, um, food containers, 
like Tupperware, I won't say the, the $2 containers that you um, can also buy to store food in as a temporary measure, but your long-term storage containers are also suitable, but keeping in mind, like Michelle was saying, about the buffering and um, things like that. If your shoe boxes, if you still want to retain and store your shoes in your shoe boxes, obviously they're not archival, so we need to provide that layer, um, that interleaving layer, uh, like Michelle mentioned, um, poly, uh, polyethylene sheeting is something that you can line, but then always use um, your fabric layer between your, your object and, your, um, and the plastic. So there's, there's other, you know, general items out there that you can use to create the same system as what we're looking at with your, your bo boxes that Michelle talked about. So. Thank you, Camilla and Michelle. So now I think we have time for questions. We're going to have questions from our Visions audience first and then we'll cross to Kayama for questions. So please wait until a microphone comes around to you to ask your question and you can say your name if you like um, before your question as well. Thank you for that. Oh. Thank you. That was really wonderful and so interesting. And I've got a million questions, but I'll just ask one. Um, once upon a time, people used to um, wrap these items in tissue paper, but there's not a skerrick there. Is there a reason for that? Um, there's nothing wrong with using um, acid-free tissue paper. Uh, what I suppose we're trying to move away from it in terms of long-term storage um, for a number of reasons. One, uh, you don't get that nice smooth surface necessarily. Um, over time it does compress so you're having to revisit um, your item again to create that shape that you're wanting um, to create and or keep that shape of the, the object whether it's a shoe or hat or anything else. Um, it also, there's a possibility of insects, it's sort of harbouring in, within the tissue. Um, silverfish, uh, insects do like to eat tissue. They don't necessarily like to eat polyester um, material. So there's nothing just wrong with the acid-free tissue. I suppose, you know, if you're looking at long-term and that sort of prevention, we're, we're moving more towards these other materials to create that support. Hello. Um, I was just wondering what happens in, uh, when you have a longer gown um, that might need to be folded um, multiple times or, or how would you deal with that? And also, second question, where do you source the um, uh, archival boxes and things from, the cardboard ones? Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, I can answer <laughs> that one. Uh, well, if you have a, a large textile object, um, you can actually um, purchase boxes which are for textile storage specifically. Um, if you have a, a, a very long, perhaps a train or a, a veil or a long christening gown, um, it's preferable, obviously, if you can support the whole object flat in a box, but if, if you are a bit limited with space, you can again use the uh, par silk Dacron sausages as a roll to carefully wrap your, your object. And again, you would be interleaving that with, um, with the par silk um, to prevent layers contacting. Um, because the, the main thing you want to do is really prevent any definite creases from forming in your textile because if you're putting it away for long-term storage, those, those fibres can eventually, if they are breaking down, cause splits in, in your object. So the, the other thing you can do too is make soft doonas to fit inside your object um, as long as it's not going to cause any compression or permanent creases. Um, in terms of the boxes, they can be sourced through uh, archival supplies. If you, if you just um, do a web search for archival supplies, there are quite a number online that you can purchase. Hmm. Are 
Thank you for your um, uh, interesting lecture. Uh, notice that with the ribbon that you roll that in around a core, but what do you do with long leather straps? How do you conserve the leather that might be a strap with a shoe that is uh, uh, maybe, say, half a metre long, something like that? What process would you use for that? Uh, well, the, the example I've given here, you would really only use for a flat single layer ribbon. So if you have, say, um, a ribbon on the, the edge of a bonnet or a shoe strap that's multiple layers, you really don't want to wind that tightly. Um, you, would, you would want that to be loose, if, if you can, um, just very loosely around the outside if you have your shoes, say, in the centre of the box and have them very loosely um, around the outside you, you, because you don't want, if you're storing something to be long-term, to then have that memory of them being very tightly rolled, which then would cause another issue. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I had another question about cleaning the objects and or what do you do to clean them before you put them away? Uh, yes, I, I didn't sort of run through that, but I can just run through briefly what our process would be at the museum. Um, it's ideal to, to store your objects clean because if you're putting them away dirty, um, they can attract insects, particularly if they have... Um, food stains and that type of thing. But um, just very generally, we would be uh, removing dust from the surface by a very low suction vacuum. And we have a special set of uh, tools that we would use um, just at a raking angle and sometimes through a screen to reduce the dust on an object before we put it away. Uh, particularly if you have an object with a pile, say velvet, fur, that type of thing, you really want to make sure that all of the dust is removed from that before it goes into storage. Does that answer your question? Sorry, it's a beaded christening gown? Yes, again, um, a very low, low suction vacuum, and, and obviously you're not going to be vacuuming straight onto your object. It needs to be at a, at a raking angle and a very low suction. Um, the, the screen is ideal for, for beaded objects because you're not going to inadvertently suck up any of your beads if they happen to be loose. Or a very uh, soft brush is good as well for the beaded areas. You can just gently brush those areas to remove any, any loose dust. But certainly assess the object and you know, how fragile is the silk and the, and the beads. So I think you need, yeah, we normally need to do that assessment before we go to whatever treatment we look at. And if it's something of concern, then it might be that you may need to contact someone um, to look at it closer. Yeah. If you can see any loose fibres mm. or beads, it, yes, it's probably a good idea to, to have a conservator look at cleaning that for you. Were there, were there a list of, was that the list of archival uh, yes. contents? So if you visit the AICCM website, and if you just do a search for AICCM, it'll come up. Um, there, there is a, a link to conservators in your area, um, and, and all of the conservators on that website are, are, are good people to, to contact. Okay, so that, that's wonderful. Now we'll, we'll cross to Kayama and, and take questions from everyone there. Hi, um, we really enjoyed your presentation at Kayama. Um, got some fabulous hints with what we can do there. Our, one of my questions would be, I have an um, old top hat displayed on a wooden hat stand and it's quite a solid hat stand. Would there be any problems with um, that situation? Would there be any transfer from the wood across to the hat? Depending on the... the the wood that's been used for the hat stand, there could possibly be acid, um, acidity being transferred, and normally a, a top hat would have a may have a silk lining, so that may react with the silk. So it might be an idea to just 
provide a, a barrier and whether it is the par silk um, barrier that's, that would help reduce any of that. Thank you, that sounds like a good idea. Thanks very much. That's all the questions from Kayama. Okay, I, I, um, take more questions from Visions if there's any. Um, this question might be out of the scope of, of this discussion about um, shoes and hats, um, but in terms of accessories, um, things like um, parasols or um, fans that might be made of fabric, feathers, um, you know, deli delicate um, things, is, is that out of the scope of this particular discussion in terms of uh, storage for those kind of objects? Um, no, I mean it's just similar to you, you do have shoes that have a combination of material, silk, beaded, um, hats with feathers, so it's not out of the scope. The, the, I suppose the principles are the same, whether it's a shoe hat or a parasol. So, you know, similar techniques for your packing, um, assessing the object before actually handling it, um, boxing it so you're supporting all areas and with a, a fan, you know, if, you've, if it's able to be opened out, obviously it doesn't sit flat so you will need to support the area that's slightly raised. Um, with your parasol, again, we normally like to store them upside down so that it, the weight of it, um, but it does need to have a special support to support the, the handle. I mean, I don't know what sort of a handle it has, whether it's a carriage parasol or a, um, or a, a straight handle on it. Um, sometimes you can store them upside down, but it's really, you need to assess the item. You can make a little cover for them like that, where if you're you know storing it upside down, it actually the cover actually um, supports um, the parasol. So there's a number of ways, but a lot of the techniques that we've talked about here can be adapted to those objects. <laughs> My voice is probably loud enough without it. I'm assuming that a normal cardboard box is not acid free and even with a par silk lining or good buffering, this is not a good idea, is that correct? Like an ordinary box that you might, not just a shoe box, no, ordinary brown yep. cardboard corrugated yep. boxes That's I right. presume have acid in them. Well it wouldn't necessarily be acid free, no. but we we're talking about providing a barrier and that can be through using your poly ethylene sheeting mm -hmm. as your initial layer mm. and then using your fabric as your co contact with your object. So, so you could use a plain box as long as you had the uh, barrier. Um, sufficient buffering in yeah. the parcel. Mm. Thank a lot you. A lot of your, um, freeze, uh, your oven bags, yes. um, they are a, they're suitable for lining okay. and providing that barrier Lovely. as well. Thanks very much. Okay. Okay, well, um, thank you everyone and um, thank you for your participation, Kayama. Um, so I'd like to urge everyone again to go and check out our um, Glorious Days Australia 1913 exhibition um, and thank you for coming along to our workshop today. Thank you.